and who, I was arguing with somebody uh, last this week too. I think it was a, uh, yeah, it was a Vital again, and uh, he was trying to say about the thirteenth, thirteenth uh, and fourteenth amendments and all this nonsense, entitled, you know, entitled for uh, title forty two, all this civil rights nonsense. I said that's for free black slaves. I said, I said, dude, you're getting silly. I said, I'm not a freed black slave. I said, if I want to claim something, I said, I said, I said, well, don't you understand? Back then, during the Civil War time, there was no United States citizen. Did you understand that? And I think he kind of did, but I don't know if people listening on this show understand that back then, in the, before like 1865, 1867, there was no United States citizen. And I said to him, what kind of citizens were there? What kind of citizens were there? They're state citizens. Yeah. I said to Vital, he's like, well, it's all different now. We're United States citizens. Oh, really? You think so? We're U.S. citizens now? Why don't you pull out your birth certificate and tell me what state does it say you're from? says you're from the United States or says you're from uh, New York State, from California, or the state of Massachusetts. What's your birth certificate say? I don't see in the United States of America birth certificates. I certainly don't have one. So what are you talking about, United States citizen? What are you talking about? The reason why they had to create a United States citizen is because when they released all those slaves, Alabama didn't want to make them citizens. Georgia did not want to make them citizens. Mississippi didn't want to make them citizens, members of their family. So they were basically just wandering like people, wandering on the land. They had no nation. They had no state. They had no collective. They had nobody to go to or turn to. So the United States had to so you know what? These guys are just roaming around. <laughs> you know, basically like almost like Indians, you know, like just like Indians just roaming around. Why don't we give them a title and why don't we get them under somebody's jurisdiction and control? I said, Vital, what's the big deal about this? I said, so this rock class is always screaming 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment, why? So I'm a freed slave? What? And I'm just roaming around and they got to treat me in a certain way? That sounds ridiculous. I said, I'm sure the 14th Amendment mattered at one period of time. I would say like the Bill of Rights, you know, like the Third Amendment. I'm sure the Third Amendment meant something at, at a certain period of time. Well, what does it mean now? What does it stand for? You know what I'm saying? What's the Third Amendment? Gus, anybody? The uh, there's two Thirteenth Amendments, yeah, but neither one no, of them third. really matters. No, no, the, the third, the Third Amendment. The Third Amendment? Yeah. Uh, quartering of uh, soldiers. Yeah, in private homes without the owner's consent. Now, just because they wrote a Fourteenth Amendment doesn't mean it didn't just exist for two, three years and then disappeared. Same thing with this Third Amendment. You can't quarter soldiers in a private home without the artist's consent in peacetime. Okay? When how how long did that stay in force? How long was that necessary? It's ridiculous. What's the fourteenth amendment? It's ridiculous. But everybody screams up and down, oh the fourteenth amendment guarantees US citizens I'm not a US citizen. I hail from New York State. My birth certificate says I'm from the state of New York. I'm one of the people of New York State. The United States, um, isn't that some sort of a corporation like Coca-Cola? I'm not a member of the Coca-Cola family. It says United States. It doesn't say United States of America. It says United States. There's a difference between Coke and Coca-Cola. I sure don't want my kids doing Coke, but I don't mind if they do Coca-Cola. Uh, there's certainly a difference between the United States and the United States of America. 
what makes you think I want to be a member of the family known as the United States? Why would I want to be a member of a corporate, a corporate charter? Well, why? Uh, if if there is some sort of benefit, believe me, I'll use it when I when I feel that it's proper. But if I don't feel there's any benefit, why should I use that benefit? I'll just keep it in my back pocket and use it when I feel like it. So like I said, it just makes me laugh when these guys, like these Rod Class guys, scream up and down about these, you know, Title 42. And I don't care if they start screaming up and down, uh, you know, Title 26, and they, they start going off about all the silly stuff. Who cares? Who cares? Did you create that? No. Can you control it? No. You know, what? what can you do? Nothing. They can modify that code at will. Look at that letter that Larry sent me. Larry sent me the letter from uh, that court. I believe it was in Ohio. It was in Ohio or Kentucky. I think I sent it to you, Gus. I'm not sure. But one of the reasons why the judge denied the lady's uh, petition or motion or whatever is they said, I don't see anywhere on file that you're a, you know, card-carrying, union-carrying, card-carrying member of the bar. So everything that you're putting into the court that's based on legalese has no merit, has no standing. So I'm trying to remember if Larry, uh, I think Larry t- emailed it to me. I don't think Larry text messaged it to me. I think, I think Larry emailed it to me. But you see what I'm trying to say? So if the court wants you, allow you to play pro se, they'll allow you to play pro se for a little bit. What I'm saying is this lady stuff, it might have been dynamite. It might have been better than any lawyer on planet Earth, any attorney on planet Earth could probably muster and put before the court. She might have had some dynamite legal points. She might have had the most perfect code citations. She might have had everything. Perfect. It could have been like the judge says, oh, my God, I've never seen such. This is, this is the best I've ever seen. And he said, well, how are we going to stop her? How are we going to deny her when, when everything she's saying is perfect? It's flawless. It's, it's, it's guaranteed 100% A-OK. How do we stop her? Uh, let's say that it's, um, we don't see anywhere on file that she's a card-carrying union member of any bar association here in the state of, uh, Ohio, so let's strike it down by that. And that's what they did. So why? Well, here you go. I found it. Yay. Man, I haven't opened up my email in a long time, man. Holy cow. <laughs> 3,597 behind. That's too funny. <laughs> yeah, right. That really inspires me to start doing emails. <laughs> but yeah, let me let me get exactly what the judge said and let me find the exact uh, state that it was in. Yeah, Cayuga County, Ohio. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. It says, uh, here you go. Reviews of the affiant affidavits reveal that the affiants makes multiple legal conclusions throughout their affidavits, but fail to establish that they are attorneys licensed in the state of Ohio. Oh, isn't that special? So we're going to have to deny you. <laughs> it, doesn't say, it doesn't say they made multiple legal conclusions throughout their affidavits, which they tell you, hey, man, you know, you know that's what they want you to do. So then if you actually go out and do it, and you're actually damn good at it, and you know what? You probably kick that, you know, kick that teeth in. They're like, uh, uh, yes, I, but uh, wait a second. I don't see where it, where she shows that she's a card carrying member of our union. So uh, unless you're a card carrying member of our union, we can, uh, you know, we have to. We're gonna have to deny you <laughs> access. We're gonna have to deny you access to this court. We're gonna have to deny you access to have any paperwork put in here. We're gonna have to deny you. So it's ridiculous. So you're telling me if she got if, if she got a real estate attorney who knew absolutely nothing about whatever she was battling them on, or if she got a uh, import export attorney and he put paperwork in there, are you trying to tell me that? Oh, okay, you know, now they'll recognize it. No, they'll just find something else to deny it. Like I told you guys a billion times, like that big Jewish law firm in Alabama said, look, if you beat them, you realize what's going to happen. Yeah, we're going to win. Yeah, we're going to beat the state. You, know, you realize what's going to happen? They're going to overturn every single one of our cases that we've ever won in the last 50, 60 years of this firm's history. Every single one of our clients are going to have to return every single dime that they ever were awarded by the court. 
all of our attorney fees is going to have to go back. So, if you want us to help your brother, and we win, do you realize what the court, what do you realize what the the judiciary is going to do to us? Do you realize what is going to happen to us? So it's a no-win game. You can't play in their legal system. It's it's rigged. It's a certain way, and this is the way the outcome is going to be. Go ahead, go get your 1975 filings with the the United States Supreme Court, and go ahead and run them through for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Go ahead. Making your mission in life. Go ahead. Totally waste your time. Do, go ahead and do it. On your deathbed, I hope they say, you know what, um, yeah, you won. You know, we rule in your behalf. And uh, the opinion of the court was 9-0. Uh, you know, take it back to the court of original jurisdiction and let them have another whack at it. And then bring our opinion with you. That, that, that might make them uh, change their minds. Because the United States Supreme Court doesn't create the law. The Congress does. The congregation of, you know, these uh, elected officials in Washington, D.C., they're the ones that create, you know, federal law. No, not federal law. United States of America, you know, United States government law. Anything could be federal. Like I said, they got federal law in Mexico, federal law in Canada. That's why I love when Canadians come on here and they said they went to court today. I said, oh, what court? Oh, federal court. Oh, okay, good. You hear that, people in the United States? We're not federal. It's not exclusive. It's it's worldwide. It's probably universal. But yeah, I, I, that's 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 good, uh, Pat. You know, I'm glad that you brought those things up because, like I said, I like I like hearing you guys talk, and then I like jumping in between and trying to dispel what I believe you guys still think has some sort of importance that somehow we should be looking at, like we could possibly care less. With the United States opinion of the United States Supreme Court, great. I'm sure they're very. I'm sure they're very nice guys, and I'm sure they'd be wonderful neighbors. And I'm sure if I had a problem, and I said, "Hey, you know what, uh, Mr. Scalia, I got, I got an ethical question here. Give me your opinion on this." I'm sure he'd do a dynamite job. You know, but um, other than that, they're just opinions of. They're just people. They're just. They're just a man. They're just like anybody else that walks on planet Earth. They have an opinion. They're fallible. They get things right sometimes. Sometimes they, you know, and maybe they were, it's their opinion. It's what they were witnessed at that moment in time. Or through, at their 50, 60 years, 70 years of being on planet Earth. They gathered all their experience and said, you know what? If I was you, you younger guys, this is what I would do. And they just pass it down to people who uh, might have been busy being doctors or plumbers or electricians. And they're like, you know what? We read books. We read, uh, you know when a woman comes to court and two women come to court and they want the baby and how do we split the baby in half, they read, They had time to read this stuff. The women, they didn't have time to read it. They were busy being moms or they were busy being teachers or electricians or whatever, dental hygienists, whatever. They didn't. They, they don't know how to settle it. You're just going to an old wise guy saying, hey, based on your opinion, based on your experience, on you know, based on your readings that you've done, based on opinions in the past, what seems to work? What seems to be the best course of action? What seems to be the best way to go? Can you give us your learned opinion? That's all it is. So when somebody says to somebody like me, we'll call you practicing law. Dude, I'm just giving you my opinion. That's all any of these people are doing. They're giving you their opinion. The United States Supreme Court always says at the bottom, the opinion of the court. They don't say the law of the court. They don't say this is the law of call. This is called opinion. Based upon what I witness, based upon what I see I believe works, this is what I would do. If we were in an Islamic country, I'd base everything upon, upon Sharia law. When we live in, upon this land, I base everything upon Judeo-Christian beliefs, Judeo-Christian values. That's what I'm giving people. This is what I've witnessed. This is what I've read. This is what the course of action, this is the place, this is the way I would do it. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's not right. I'm not saying it's not correct. I'm not saying it is correct. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it is wrong. I'm just saying, hey, I'm just bearing witness. This is what God gave me to work with, and I uh, hope you could do something with it. If you could do something with it, God bless you. If you can't, oh, well, man, you know. And, you know, it's been nice talking to you, but hopefully it'll work out. Like I said to everybody, it'll... Uh, once it switch over to a cold land, a one-world order, I said all my opinions... <laughs> Ain't worth a pile of beans. But right now, it's not a cold land. Right now, we're still in the land of man. 
right now man can evoke man. You know, man doesn't have to rely upon any silly code. But one day if this becomes a code land, oh well, this is the land of code. We're all going to be, you know, locked into some ridiculous code. And uh, just like the U.S. Marshals asked me, he said, how long do you think it's going to take, you know, for them to turn us into France? I said, I don't know, man. I said, I'm sure they're trying as hard as they can. I said, well, the best way to do is disrupt the currency. The best way to do is make a monetary, a monetary and make a panic and have the banks close and have the banks, you know, say we're not going to loan money anymore or we're not going to give credit anymore and watch people have to survive on their own devices and people don't know how to do that anymore. People don't know how to do anything other than live on credit. So when you close that, you say you cancel the mortgages or call all the mortgages in or you call all the credit card debt in and whatever happens. The bank says, oh, well, you know, we need the money, you know, because uh, we're in financial straits and we need to call in all our loans. We need to call in all our markers and the people default like crazy. I said, that kind of stuff could create a code world. That could create a code land real easy. Because the banks would, would tell the, all the, you know, congressmen, it's like, look, you start passing all these laws that people can't use this against us in courts anymore. You can't use common law anymore. You can't call us out man to man anymore. You can't call a banker out as a man. You can't do that. You got to give us total immunity. You got to give us total, you know, sovereignty. You know, you got to got to make us equal with every other being on planet Earth. Or we're going to close up shop and we're going to go to China. So I said, that's what I said to the U.S. Marshals. I said, that's the way I can see them going with this. I said, but other than that, being in the land of man is a lot of fun. The only problem is that when when men think and act like a man, but they're not truly a man, they're going to take advantage of the situation. And so if my stuff gets out and everybody starts calling them in as man on man, every single weasel, every single you know guy who's a deadbeat you know, yeah, on his debt, every deadbeat woman, you know, they're going to use this. And they're going to push this system into overdrive. They're going to move it into the cold land that much quicker because they're not honorable, decent people that walk upon this land. You know, they're greedy, avarice, avarice people. They're, they're, they're gluttonous, and they're, they're, it's all about me. It's the whole total me generation running running around still. They have to... They have to uh, Go to the Himalayas, you know, by the time they're 67, uh, George Bush Sr. is still jumping out of airplanes like on his 90th birthday. You know, he's still going to the North Pole, spending a million dollars to do it. Why? Dude, well, why, why are you doing it? You know, why, why are you spending money on, on, on silly things, on trivial things? Well, I had to see the Galapagos Islands before I died. Oh, man, you know, really? Why? What was going to happen? You couldn't think about doing something else with your money, like maybe putting a, a pump or well in for some like starving children in uh, Nicaragua or something like that. No, you had to go to Galapagos just one more time. You just had to see that dodo bird. You just couldn't couldn't exist. You, you just couldn't have a happy life before you do that. You couldn't think about, hey, well, we take that money and pull it together. And let's dig some wells in uh, for third world nations. Yeah, let's go do that. We're like, nah. You know, let, let, let's go to the South Pole one more time. Let's go jump out of a skydive out of a plane one more time. Okay. But like I said, it, it just makes you laugh. You know, people feel this, they got value and importance. So like I said, you know, when will this turn into a code land? I think after financial collapse, that'd be the easiest way to do it. People just be begging for anything to stabilize the economy. Because, like I say, what's funny is if you go back and you listen to anybody like these uh, Glenn Beck kind of guys, you go back five, ten years ago, and tw by 2015, I think gasoline was supposed to be two, three hundred dollars a gallon. Not two dollars a gallon. It's supposed to be like two, three hundred dollars a gallon for a gasoline. So, like I said, this, this, that's what I'm saying about the rock class kind of guy. The United States government should be happy they've got this crazy guy running around out there saying. Oh, Title 42. Oh, Title 26. Oh, the IRS. Oh, the code clearly stays. Oh, really, the code. Really. If me and Gus are talking in the code and I say, hey, I'll give you a, make sure you bring the 300 uh, uh, widgets and I'll make sure I bring the 73 uh, uh, shamoles when we meet next time. What's a shamole? I don't know. What's a clam? I don't know. What's a widget? I don't know. We're speaking in code. You know, when we give you a definition, maybe, maybe that's what it means. Maybe, maybe not. 
because you're, you're not, you're not, I don't see anywhere on file where you know an attorney. No, let me, let me check one more time. No, I don't see anywhere here. Uh, it's all your legal conclusions and all what you believe are uh, amendments read and everything that you believe our codes read. Nope, nope. Uh, I see that uh, the affidavit makes multiple legal conclusions throughout their affidavits but fail to establish that their attorneys licensed in the state of Ohio or California or New Hampshire or Chicago or, or uh, Illinois. I'm sorry, I don't see that you're established as an attorney. So um, all your legal conclusions, they're falling on deaf ears because you're not one of us. You're not of our society. You're not a member. You have no control over us. That's right. And that's what you people fail to realize. They have no control over man. They have control over defendants and affiants and all these little silly names and titles that they give you. They got no control over man. And that's why I say it a billion times. Why are you people accepting this silly title as defendant? I mean, defendant is wonderful things at times. Like I said, Muhammad Ali had to defend the heavyweight championship of the world, I don't know, 40-something times. It's a wonderful thing to have the whole world recognize you when you step off an airplane and everyone will want to jump on you because you're a defendant. You're a defending champion. Okay, great. But you know what? At this time, I, I can't be the defendant. I can't be the, uh, I can't. I'd love to play your little game. I'd love to be in your little uh, arena. I'd love to be in your forum. I'd love to be in your little court. But at this time, I don't have the capacity. Why? Because I think you're moving under something under legalese. Yeah, well, aren't you giving me multiple legal conclusions that I've done something, uh, what you believe is criminal? Yeah, well, since you're making multiple legal conclusions throughout your uh, affidavits, um, I'm sorry, but I'm not a licensed attorney to practice in the state of uh, Ohio. I have no idea what the hell you're saying. Well, it's very easy to understand. No, sir, you don't understand. There's no place that I'm filed. There's, there's nothing, no place I'm filed here within the state of Ohio or Virginia that states I'm an attorney. Why are you speaking to me and making legal conclusions and legal assumptions and presumptions? Why are you doing it? You know I'm not a member of your society. Why are you keep harassing me with this silly nonsense? Speak to me man to man. Well, I can't do that. That's right. Because you'd have to bear liability for every damn word that's coming out of your mouth, wouldn't you? That's right. How hard is this to understand? Little Brian Bonnevay figured it out real easy. He figured it out when he just walked around with that little piece of common law paper in his hand, and then he realized he showed up in the court one day without that little common law piece of paper in his hand. And they jumped all over him like a pack of wolves. And then the next time he came back with that piece of paper, and they were all was like vampires and garlic. It was ridiculous. He was like, holy shit. He said, that crap worked. And when I didn't bring the paperwork in, he realized, they're like, wow, you know, this guy's, uh, this guy forgot to bring his garlic. <laughs> so let's chop him. <laughs> I mean, it's, a bunch of, it, 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 it's just a lot of fun when you, when you guys start figuring it out. But somebody said that to me today. They say, ain't you worried if somebody issues out a warrant for your arrest? I said, to issue something has got to come from the hand of man. So some man would have to say I've done him wrong. So it would be a civil action against me. It wouldn't be criminal. Because the state of Ohio or the state of Illinois or the state of Virginia couldn't make that claim. They can make a complaint, but the only problem is they'd have to bring one single man forward. The same thing that they said to... Al Gore. I saw that guy, that uh, Michael, uh, what was his name? Uh, that, that guy who made Bowling for Columbine, that uh, Michael Moore, screaming up and down at one of the Oscar presentations that he won, saying that uh, election was stolen from him by the United States Supreme Court, but from Al Gore. It's like, no, it wasn't. The United States Supreme Court said, Al Gore, you have no standing in our court. Why? Because there's no man in this court making a claim. You say, but look at all the affidavits. Look at all the, uh, dude, okay, lots of affidavits about um, hanging chairs and miscounting and police roadblocks and people not being able to get to the polling stations. That's great. Lovely stories. Lovely. Oh, such high drama and such antics. And, oh, my God, it's so heart-wrenching and gut-wrenching. And, oh, it's, it's heartbreaking. Oh, my God. Oh, those poor people down there. Oh, yeah. Um, where's the man? Well, Gordon, you, you did bring a man, right? You, you did bring at least one? 
Well, uh, uh, but look at all the paperwork. I got tracked to trial a lot of evidence. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Where's the man? Where's the man who's going to stand behind all that? Just one. Just one man. Well, uh, gee, uh, I got my uh, 17 attorneys and nine law firms that helped me with this. Let me ask them. Hey, guys, did anybody remember to bring a man before the United States Supreme Court? Oh, well, no. Oh, well, then uh, they're saying, you know, it took them three minutes to read the to come up with the opinion that uh, uh, we have no standing here. That's right. There is no man to stand here before the United States Supreme Court and make a claim or a complaint that his vote wasn't counted. Not a single man showed up. So whose vote wasn't counted? Oh, well, thousands. Obviously, look at all these pieces of paper. Yeah, the only problem is that these are, uh, what do they call them, um, secret ballots? Yeah, why didn't you have somebody uh, write their name and sign their name? Oh, well, uh, you know, we have secret ballots in this country. Oh, why? So nobody would be held liable for the actions of the elected? Oh, that, that sounds kind of silly. Why shouldn't we all uh, have to uh, bear liability for the man or woman that represents us, just like when we hire an attorney? We, 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 we elect to have a, uh, an attorney or a lawyer represent us in a courtroom. We bear full liability for their actions. We're going down with the ship. So uh, why don't we go down when the President of the United States uh, gets the, uh, the, 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 the country into, into a war and uh, kills innocent women and children? How come we're not liable to those families? Well, how come when we, they, they get in, into bankruptcy that every man and woman doesn't get their paycheck garnished to pay off the national debt? Why doesn't that happen? It would make sense to me. If I'm a member of a family and uh, the head of the family says, oh, the family's bankrupt, I'm going to have to take a little back from all my children, from all the members of the family, so I can pay off the debt, so we don't lose the, the land, we don't lose the farm, we don't lose our stuff, because we owe it debt. Why don't we just garnish everybody's uh, paycheck? Oh, I guess that's what happens when you deal with the IRS. Oh, I guess they garnish your paycheck to help pay the national debt. Oh, that's right, I guess they do do that. I guess there really is a really great benefit to uh, be a member of the United States uh, government, to be a member of their family. That's right, they get to go on your paycheck when they don't feel that you're paying enough for your fair share to support their government. Not my government, their government. Not a government of man, a government of uh, elected officials under some sort of charter, constitution, or contract. That's right. That's like, oh, Cole, what would you rather have us do? It's like, um, well... I don't think any Pakistanis, man, have a Navy. And I don't think they'd be coming over here with any kind of flotilla on camels anytime soon. I think I'm okay here in, in Virginia. I don't think we're going to be attacked. I think I'm going to be just fine. And I think the people, uh, like I said, everybody used to say the red menace, the Chinese. The Chinese people, like the number one, like other than like maybe Italians or Irish, are like family-oriented, like unbelievable. They don't want to lose their women and children. They don't want to put their their, their kids to war. You know, and when people start realizing that these Chinese people are decent people, they like, holy crap, why are we scared about this red menace all the time? You know, and like to say, oh, like it's Russians. I said, like, Russians, are you kidding me? I mean, maybe afraid of the women, but the guys are always drunk. You know, what, what Russian guy am I afraid of? I've never met a Russian guy that wasn't pickled by 5 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, if you're going to have a battle, you better have it at 9 o'clock in the morning, because these guys by 5, they're going to be smashed. So, like I said, once you start realizing the people around the world, it, it's like this fear. And they mobilize this due to fear. And once we could actually have the Internet now and see that people aren't as uh, evil or as uh, you know menacing as, as the government wanted us to believe, we all start laughing at them, like the emperor's got no clothes. We're like, okay, what's the new fear today? Oh, uh, ISIL. Oh, ISIL. You mean ISIS? Oh, no, no, we call it ISIL. Oh, that's right. The you know Barack Obama he's Islamic so that's right he can't call it he can't call it ISIS because that's right he can't make war on his own people on his own kind that's right so he keeps mispronouncing and calls it an ISIL he's not it's not a mispronouncing I guarantee he said to his speechwriters due to my religious background my faith and my beliefs I cannot create war on my own kind just like if he was Jewish he couldn't declare it just like if he was Catholic he couldn't declare it so he's like I can't declare it on my own kind. You're going to have to come up with another name because I'm not saying ISIS. So they said, well, I'll just say ISIL then. ISIL, what's that? Uh, people won't care. They'll just think you're saying ISIS. 
And they, well, that I could say. I'm at war with ISIL. And what's ISIL? It doesn't exist. Just just say we're at war with ISIL. Why? Because it's just a made-up ridiculous name. Nobody's claiming to be ISIL on planet Earth. And there's not one group that says we're ISIL. So it would just go on to TV and look real stern and look real convincing that we're going to war with ISIL. And we've got to take in a, a couple of trillion dollars and we've got to raise your taxes and you know, and this is what we've got to do to fight that evil ISIL. You know, all the people who believe it just look real stern and sincere in the camera. And that way you can keep your Muslim faith uh, in good standing with your, with your ISIS buddies. And that way the American people could think that we're in a panicky war again. Like, oh my God, no, not ISIL. They're going to they're take us over. Oh no, the ISILs are coming. 